Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. I am going to say this is my first time wearing a face shield, so if you can't hear me, if you're struggling to hear me, please say so, because um, I'm very loud to my, to my own self, so I apologize. Um, and before I begin, I do want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank Garrett College and all of the hard work that the staff has put into hosting this series. And I've enjoyed the previous talks immensely. And I was lucky enough um, for them to give me one of my favorite things, a captive audience. And hopefully all of you are interested in history if you came here today. Um, and you're hopefully interested in the French and Indian War, which is the topic of my research. And it's all local history to us here in Western Maryland. But um, speaking of close to home, at the Joan Crawford series in October, I was lucky enough to hear her daughter talk about her mother's experiences in World War II. And that really hit close to home for me. That is where my passion and love of history started, was listening to my grandparents' stories of World War II and about buying shoes with ration coupons, about my grandfather teaching um, men to swim in his early Navy days, and finally, um, with my grandmother telling me stories about how her previously all-female college was bursting to the seams with men in cots after the GI Bill passed. Um, and I have started telling some of these stories to my students, and they have really resonated. Um, these micro-histories, these individual histories are what capture their attention. That's always what has captured my attention as you're going to see today, I talk about a lot of different individuals and their stories. But my plea for all of you is to talk about your own histories. You never know who you are inspiring. My students, since I started doing this, are coming to me and saying, well, I talked to my grandparents, or I talked to my aunt, or I talked to my neighbor. And they're really being inspired to dig at that history right at their fingertips. So please, talk about your past with your friends, neighbors, and relatives. You just don't know who you're going to inspire. So to tell you a little bit about my own history and my research, um, it also is a story of how we get to where, what we're talking about today. Um, I'm a Western Maryland girl, born and raised, and I was always very interested in the local history around me. And I was very interested in how the Europeans who first came into this area saw and wrote down their recollections of the mountains and the streams that I was seeing on a daily basis. And they were also writing down their recollections about um, the natives that they met when they came here, the Native Americans, whether it would be Nemecolon, who we're going to get to talk about in a few minutes, or whether it was Will of Will's Mountain, and you get to kind of hear those accounts. And it really was inspiring. And so when I started about my journey at Frostburg State, I started writing about Two local history, two local history figures, um, Thomas Cressip and Christopher Gist, and you may not have heard of them, or you may have heard of them. I'm going to be talking about them today. Um, and part of what I learned was that they were active in Washington's Trail in the expedition that he took in 1753. And um, if you're not familiar with that event, let me give you a really quick history. George Washington in 1753 was a young 21-year-old. And he didn't have a lot of experience under his belt, like many 21-year-olds. And he was sent by the Virginia governor, Robert Dinwiddie, to tell the French, who had built forts in the Ohio Valley, to tell the French army that they needed to get out. And Washington only had a very small group with him. And the French pretty much laughed in his face and told him to leave. And subsequently, we end up with the French and Indian War. Now that's the very quick version of events. I'm going to expand on that a lot today. But if you're not familiar, that's kind of the story that gets told. That's the short version. But today I'm going to present a broader, more in-depth history of this expedition and really show how it was the independent interests of the British and the Virginians, British, American, and Native Americans. It was their enterprise, it was their interest that really drove the British Empire west, including Washington's expedition to Fort LeBeouf. Now, when I started doing this research, um, I went to WVU when I was working on my master's thesis, and I focused on the years prior to 1753, so prior to Washington's expedition. And I was looking at imperial intentions and independent interests, the Ohio Company of Virginia and its agents, Thomas Cressip and Christopher Gist. 
And it was with this project that I started to think about not only how big events, whether it be World War II or the French and Indian War, affected the local history here that I was seeing in Western Maryland, but also how these events and these individuals living here were having international ramifications, that they were a very crucial part of the narrative of British Empire building and of the French and Indian War. And it made a lot of sense to me that these people working, living in the Ohio Valley would have a lot more say and a lot more influence over what was going on in the Ohio Valley than did the king or a council many thousands of miles away. And I was very lucky that I was correct in my assumptions. I was able to find this in the documents and, um, and see how the actions of these individuals had a massive influence in this international conflict. The French and Indian War takes place on three continents, in North America, in Asia, and in Europe. And so they have this huge international ramifications, and I really was interested in exploring that here. And I was really surprised to find that there wasn't a whole lot written about this. There wasn't a whole lot there. What information I could find was in the introductions to books or in the footnotes kind of buried in these books about the French and Indian War, about the origins of the war. And they kind of mentioned these men and their activities as precursors to Washington's expedition to Fort LeBeouf. So this has traditionally been this trip to Fort LeBeouf um, in 1753, which they're calling Washington's Trail on these road signs, has been viewed traditionally as the start of the French and Indian War story, the origins of the war. And it's also until very recently been a part of Pennsylvania history, which is really interesting because the people who were undertaking this journey were from Maryland and from, from Virginia, and the Pennsylvanians were not very happy about it, but now they're, they're claiming it as part of their own. And it's only been very recently that we have seen these blue signs coming up along the roadways saying, look, oh yeah, Maryland was a part of this too. And even if you go to washingtonstrail.org, which is a great resource, it still talks about it as a largely Pennsylvania piece of history. But when you actually look at this event, Washington's expedition to Fort LeBeouf, and here's Washington's map uh, detailing his expedition and different pieces of it, um, his, his sketches, by kind of widening the scope, by looking at the years before and at the other actors besides Washington who were involved, we get a better understanding of the empire building process, that it was really multifaceted. And we get to put Western Maryland, luckily for all of us, kind of right in the thick of things. And I always am game for anything that does that. So um, this wider history, oh, one too far. The wider history that I want to talk about today and kind of take you back a few years comes from my dissertation, which I did at Kent State University. And I kind of joke, I started in Frostburg, went to WVU and ended up in Ohio. I always kind of say I was following my researchers west the people that I was researching, I was kind of going in their footsteps. Um, so the people that I was talking about here, the Ohio Company of Virginia, Thomas Cressive and Christopher Gist, they weren't getting very much print space, as I said, and there was even less given to a lot of the Native Americans who were their allies and aiding them in these endeavors. And so I kind of want to bring that kind of unspoken history out. And that's why today I entitle it a British American and Native American Enterprise. So my dissertation was Company, Colony, and Crown, the Ohio Company of Virginia, Empire Building, and the Origins of the French and Indian War. And I argue in this dissertation that it's the combined efforts of the Ohio Company of Virginia and the British Crown, which are going to kind of negotiate for what empire building is going to look like for what the empire physically is going to look like. And by doing this, they then spark that French and Indian War. And you can see here, Washington's expedition doesn't come until the fourth chapter. So I definitely don't view this as the start of things, but it's a byproduct of everything else that's coming before it. And it allows us this better understanding. Now, the Ohio Company of Virginia is a trading and a land speculation company that is formed in the 1740s and that's their crest there on the side. And if you read through here, the politicking, the mapping, 
the building, the militarizing and negotiating were all a part of this empire building process. And it kind of shows us the requirements that land speculation companies or a empire had to go through to build an empire, to expand their empire. And when it comes time for Washington to take on this expedition, the British Empire building process is well underway and has been undertaken by the Ohio Company. Now, the Ohio Company is formed by a Marylander, Thomas Cressip, and two Virginians, Lawrence Washington and Christopher Gist. And Washington, um, he kind of sticks out right away. You can see I don't have an image of here. He doesn't have a commissioned portrait. He is not wealthy. He is not a part of the Virginia gentry, so he kind of stands out. And um, he was a rough and tumble backwoodsman from Old Town, Maryland. Anyone familiar with that location? You've heard of it before? Believe it or not, when I go and talk about this in different places in the country, a lot of people haven't heard of Old Town. You know, it's, I'm not sure why that is. But um, Thomas Cressop was definitely kind of the, the, the minds behind this. He wants, he, he's engaged in a little bit of land speculation and he knows that he can make a, a name for himself, that he can become something like the Virginia Gentry if he can engage in this land speculation. But he needs some heavy hitters in order to make this happen. Um, so he meets up with the Washington and the Lee families. And they are going to form the company, they make a petition, they give it to the Virginia governor saying like, hey, we would like a land grant in the Ohio Valley. And with that, they start to fill out the membership roles with other members of the Virginia Gentry. Now, Washington, I'm sorry, Cressup has acted as an agent before. He has acted for a colony and for a royal, um, for the Charter family, but it was Maryland and the, and the Calvert family that he was acting for. And so one of the main questions I get asked was, well, why does Cressup go to these Virginians? Why doesn't he use the resources he already has, the connections he already has? And the answer has to do with Maryland's charter. Does anybody know where Maryland's charter say that Maryland ends? So we're talking about the headwaters of the Potomac. We're talking about things that are not exactly in the Ohio Valley. So the Ohio Valley is already out of their reach. But the Virginia Charter, anybody know where it ends? I heard somebody say something. The Mississippi, even farther, all the way to California, which is on no maps. So really, they have a blank check. So he goes with Virginia. And it's kind of lucky that he did because the Virginia governor, which is going to seem a little backwards here, the Virginia governor does not grant their petition. It's Governor William Gooch, and he says, you know, if I grant you this petition, it might make the locals a little angry, whether it's the Native Americans or it might make the French a little bit angry. Now, they don't live there, but they are definitely invested in the Ohio Valley. And so he's worried about that this is going to cause some trouble, stir up, you know, possibly even a war. And so he says, you know, I'm going to refer this to the Board of Trade. Now, the Board of Trade is the council in London that helps govern the colonies. They're kind of the ones who are calling all of the shots. And this means that John Hanbury has to come into the picture. Now, John Hanbury is a transatlantic merchant. He is the official trader merchant for the colony of Virginia. Um, and he becomes the Ohio Company's London agent. Um, they know him, he knows them, and they start working together. And between John Hanbury and Thomas Lee, who is the de facto leader of the Ohio Company, they are going to lobby the heck out of the Board of Trade. And they send letter and petitions and letters, basically saying, you can't let those nasty French Catholics have the back country. That, that can't happen. Uh, we need to fortify it. Look how much money we could make, and we need to defend it. And they make a really convincing argument. And the Board of Trade ends up approving their proposal in 1750. And this might seem like it's an easy call. Here comes this company who's willing to undertake all of the legwork and the expense, the money, of empire building. And that's a lot. And it's something that's actually eluded the governments in Paris and in London. They're saying it's really hard to get a bunch of settlers to have 
the same interest as the as the empires and it's a lot of it's a lot of work to manage and define the boundaries to conduct the diplomacy needed with the native americans to purchase and survey the land and so it seems like an easy decision but this is a really big deal because the board of trade hadn't really done any empire building in the ohio valley um, this is a, all of the money that was being made in the New World in North America um, was being made in the Caribbean, which is where the sugar plantations were. So this is a major policy shift, and they do say yes, because they, they kind of, I guess, are seeing the same thing that we are seeing. Well, it'd be obvious. Like, yeah, let's have these people take on the money and the expense and all of the worry, the hassle for us. Now, uh, a few things are going to happen while they are trying to get the Board of Trade to approve their petition. Um, Thomas Lee is going to replace William Gooch as the governor of Virginia. Gooch is going to retire, and Thomas Lee, that Ohio company, you know, founding member, is going to take his place as in the interim for a couple of years. Seems like a long interim. But he takes his place and he uses this to lobby for the Ohio Company. But soon, uh, Thomas Lee is going to actually, before the Ohio Company gets permission, Thomas Lee is going to pass away. So he never really sees their, their dream, uh, or at least their petition, become a reality. And Robert Dinwiddie is going to become the new leader of the colony of Virginia and the Ohio Company. Now there's a little bit of fogginess here in the record. Um, it's unsure of whether Dinwiddie was made governor because he was an Ohio Company member or if the Ohio Company member you know, approached him about being a member and giving him shares after these rumors started. So there's a little bit of, we're not exactly sure, this is one of the things that I'm hoping to get into the archives in London and the Board of Trade archives and kind of figure that out. Um, but either way, Dinwiddie is going to be continuously lobbying other governors, the Board of Trade, the Crown, the Virginia Assembly, um, with the company's cause. And he even says to Thomas Cressip in a letter, I have the success of the Ohio Company at heart. And I remember when I first started working on this project, and I was talking about it to my family, um, my younger sister said to me, isn't that corruption? <laughs> and it took me a minute because when you're a historian, you're like immersed in these documents. This is a very regular occurrence. And it's very different from how, well, maybe it's not so different from how we see government <laughs> operating today when you look at things a little more broadly. Um, but it was the way that things got done. However, you needed a whole nother set of individuals to build and map and negotiate and militarize the Ohio Valley. And you, you couldn't have the, those investors doing it. They didn't have the drive to do it. They didn't have the financial means, or the financial need, excuse me, to go out and do this. And they didn't have the knowledge. Even after Dinwiddie's been in Virginia for a number of years, he basically says, like, I don't know anything about that part of the country. And he has to defer to his agents all of the time. And they looked to Thomas Cressip, their member, to kind of find these agents for them. And he's going to find a lot of different trappers and traders who have lived and who have worked in the Ohio Valley, who have um, engaged in trade with the Native Americans, which is a crucial part of this story. It's a crucial part of empire building. And to engage in trade is also to engage in diplomacy with the way Native American politics and commerce works. So those are all very important skill sets that you have to have. Now, I can't go over every single agent. We would be here until next Tuesday. Um, but to talk about a few is one of them is Christopher Gist, and we're going to talk a lot about him today. He is an agent for the Ohio Company, a trapper, a trader, a surveyor, a diplomat, and a cultural go-between. And Gist is kind of this exception. Um, he knows how to get along in the backcountry, but he's been well-educated. He has just taken a number of um, financial missteps, I think we can say, and he has ended up kind of in dire straits, and Thomas Cressip snaps him up in a heartbeat to work for the Ohio Company. And we're also going to talk about William Trent, a trader, explorer, and military leader who is um, originally from Pennsylvania, but is going to be swayed to the Ohio Company's cause over time because he sees the financial benefits. Now, along with these um, colonists, these American colonists, 
who are going to work and build and negotiate. We also have the Ohio Company allies, um, which are going to be Native Americans, who are going to push their own interests further through working with the Ohio Company. Um, and one of these is Nemecolon. This is kind of a, another name that people from this area are familiar with. Um, but I'm not talking about golfing or polo or any of those things. I'm talking about uh, Nemecolon, the, the Delaware chief. And he is a very good friend of Thomas Cressip. Um, we're going to talk about him in a minute. But one of his main motivations is his dislike for the Pennsylvanians. And he is going to use kind of this opportunity um, to, you know, dig back at them for some previous wrongs that he sees done against him. And we're also going to be talking a lot about Tenek Harrison. I um, mean, you can see this spelled a number of different ways. This is the ways, um, if you look back through the documents and even in different books, um, you can see it spelled a number of different ways. But this is the way that um, I see most common. Now, he is a Seneca. And he has been chosen by the Iroquois to be a half king um, and to kind of serve their interest in the area around the forks of the Ohio River, around present day Pittsburgh, and in the Ohio Valley. And the Iroquois, sometimes people will say, well, I don't understand. Why are we talking about the Iroquois? They're from um, New York. Why are we talking about them in the Ohio Valley? Well, they had pretty much depleted the beaver population um, around them and into Canada, and they needed new trapping grounds. And they looked to the Ohio River Valley. And they are going to strategically attack the Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley and basically commit these, they're among the bloodiest wars in North America, in North American history. We don't actually have numbers, but according to what we can, what historians have been able to figure out, they're extremely bloody. And they basically depopulated the Ohio Valley, and then they took control of the trade, of the fur trapping business that was going on there, and that was a very lucrative business to be in. But eventually, other Native Americans are going to start to push westward as they are being pushed westward by British colonists. And so in this area here, this purple, uh, lighter purple region, that's going to be kind of this area that the Iroquois are claiming control over, but they don't live there. Um, and then with these, but this is essentially a, a blank space. Um, and but it doesn't stay that way for long because we have these Native American groups being pushed west. And one of the things that's really interesting about these groups is that they are these polyglot communities. They are made up of villages of essentially refugees that are multicultural, multilinguistic. They're not one ethnic group. They're forming new groups and new alliances all of the time. And this, um, as historians, when we talk about this kind of polyglot community that's being formed, oftentimes um, we talk about them as Ohio Indians. And so you might hear me refer to this group as a whole, these communities that are being made um, in the Ohio Valley as Ohio Indians. I try to be as specific as I can um, in reference to what the sources give me, but sometimes I have to be a bit more general. But these, these new groups that are moving in here, they really only begrudgingly accept Iroquoian control. They don't take it for granted that, that they're just going to listen to them. So there's a lot of tension here. And so the Iroquois have to hold the fish loosely, so to speak. They have to use a half-king system. They send down a headman to control a different region, and it is the half-king's um, job then to kind of maintain this relationship with the Ohio Indians. And so the, the, the Iroquois are going to claim dominion over the Ohio Valley, but it's never quite as firm as they would want you to believe. It's very tenuous and negotiated, as um, the half king only has power because the Iroquois says so. If nobody cares what the Iroquois say, you don't really have any power, do you? You have to maintain that power. And that's going to come into play here as we talk about um, the, uh, the half king's reasoning and as his actions and his enterprise through the excursions of 1753. Now, when it comes time to actually map the Ohio Valley, um, the Ohio Company um, is going to send Thomas Cressip into the borderland and into the Ohio Valley. And he is instructed to dispose of goods to the Indians on the best terms he can at such prices as the company 
shall fixed upon them. And so essentially what has happened here is the Ohio Company has decided that in order to gain the friendship and alliances and goodwill with the Native Americans, that they will subsidize the cost of the goods. So they are always the best price in town. And all, everyone wants to trade with you if you're offering the best prices. And this is gonna go on for a while, and it really causes a stir. And then in June of 1749, they decided to send Cresseth into parts beyond the mountains, which is always how they refer to the Ohio Valley, anything on the other side of the Appalachians, and um, so that they can know where to survey their land. And um, Cressop is going to go out and do this, and he's going to report the Ohio Valley is a lot bigger than we thought it was. And he kind of reports on the political climate, which is tumultuous at best. And this is quite an achievement for Cressop. However, it also is going to trip the alarms of the Native Americans living in the region and also those of the French. And the French are going to respond to this by sending their own agent, Celeron, into the Ohio Valley. And this is going to happen in 1749. And he is going to go and place a number of lead plates at different places in the Ohio Valley, at different streams, at different headwaters. Um, you can see his, uh, this is a Father Bonnie Camp's map who was with him. And Celeron comes back to the French after he does his expedition. He goes back up and tells the French governor, um, a guy named Glaçonnier, uh, Things are not going well for us. They do not look good. The British have these subsidized goods. And he says, the king must be subsidizing them. Well, he's right that they must be subsidizing their goods, but he's wrong about who is footing the bill for this. But Celeron also is going to have this very military-style mission. And that doesn't really prove attractive to the Native Americans. And um, he states that the nations of these localities are very badly disposed towards the French. They are entirely devoted to the English, and I do not know in what way they could be brought back. So faced with the reality that the French um, are not going to be able to compete commercially, Glaçonnier, the French governor, is going to see military action as the only course. And that is going to be the start of the fort building spree that we see Washington reacting to. Now, uh, the Ohio Company is going to continue to send their own expeditions. And these, there's going to be two expeditions, one from 1750 into 1751, and one from 1751 into 1752. Um, and so Christopher Gist, that agent I mentioned before, is going to go out, and he is basically sent to, to discover the lands on, upon the River Ohio. And he goes out for six months. And he comes home with reports about the politics of the region, the Native American populations, the geographic locations of some bands. And he paints a really remarkable, very attractive portrait of the Ohio Valley, talking about fertile farmland. And he talks about coal seams right on the top of the ground, like the money is out there <laughs> to be grabbed from his point of view. Now, while he's doing this, he's also acting as the British ambassador, giving gifts, relaying British messages, um, cementing relationships with Native Americans who are already predisposed to the British kind of uh, inclinations, and also trying to sway those French leading bands. And one location I want to point out in particular is this here, where it says the Peak Town. Um, it's also called Pickawillany, and it's a major village that's going to become relevant in a few more slides. Um, the Gist is going to also be ordered to keep careful records of his path to survey, and he does this, um, and he suggests some locations, and he's got them all mapped out and all surveyed. But when he comes home, the Virginians are like, you know, those are really too far away. We can't possibly supply them, let alone defend them. So go out and find somewhere else. Six months wasn't enough. So he goes back out for his second. Um, you can see this is a bit more closer to home. Um, here and he goes on this other uh, the second journey and they're also telling him that he needs to look out for good spots to put infrastructure um, keep his eye open for areas fitting for these other empire building projects and almost immediately Gist discovers a pass through the mountains near present-day Cumberland Maryland um, called the Narrows and again it's really nice to be speaking to a local audience because you guys know where I'm talking about and that's so lovely um, and when I was working as a park ranger um, in Cumberland, you would not imagine the amount of disappointed faces that I saw whenever people, I told people that this was no, not in fact the Cumberland Gap. I'm really sorry, 
but you're a couple hundred miles in the wrong direction. Um, but I always was like, but there's a really cool history here too. This one is just as impressive, I promise. Um, so he basically reports that there is this path through the mountains closer to the Potomac than anything else, that it's a really great route through the mountains, and it's going to save them money and time, making it easier for them to access the Native Americans and their trade and also the Ohio Valley riches. Um, now, if the initial forays of Cressip are going to scare the French, imagine what these very long journeys of Gis do, where he's out there handing out presents and engaging in all this diplomacy. And the French are going to continue kind of their plans for military action in the Ohio Valley, um, planning these, these fortifications, but they actually decide to bring in a new governor to oversee it. Um, Marquis de la Jonquière is going to become the new governor general of New France, but in waiting for him, they have to delay a little bit. And while they are delaying, the Ohio Company is going to take action. They start building infrastructure. They first are going to start with storehouses at Cressip's Old Town, um, taking advantage of the fact that he's already got a defensible location. A palisade is already built there. Let's take advantage of that. But they quickly outgrow that location, and they build a new location at Wills Creek, which is essentially in Cumberland, Maryland today. And this is going to be two-story buildings, a palisade, barracks, um, an armory and stables, and it's going to be eventually enclosed in a defensive palisade. And then right away, they tell Thomas Cressip and Christopher Gist, all right, now we've got our headquarters, let's build some roads from it, going places, so we can do this trade. And they had, um, one of the people who Cressip and Gist are going to ask to help is Nemecolin. And Nemecolin knows, and he's actually not, an, he's not a native of the area, he is a Delaware. Um, and he has been pushed westward by the Pennsylvanians specifically. And so he's got a bit of an ax to grind. And if you haven't caught on yet, if I haven't made it clear, the Virginia traders and the Pennsylvania traders are having their own civil war in the Ohio Valley. They don't get along well. Um, and it's going to become really frustrating to the colony of Pennsylvania whenever some of their traders start defecting to the Ohio Company because they're having so much success. But I mean, can you blame them? If you get to offer subsidized prices, it's going to be a pretty good thing. Um, but they, so Emma Colin has this ax to grind with the Pennsylvanians, and he says, yes, I will help you chart the best course through the Alleghenies, because he's been living there for decades. Um, and he's good friends with Thomas Cressip, also because Thomas Cressip has a long, ugly history with Pennsylvania. Um, but he helps them chart this path. And according to local legend, he says, as long as you name it after me, I'll help you. And that's why I always make sure I include his name, feel like I can honor that promise somewhat. But they are going to build this wagon road from Wills Creek, from Cumberland, to the forks of the Ohio River, to around modern day McKeesport. I'm sorry, McKees Rocks, excuse me, not McKeesport, McKees Rocks. Um, but the Ohio Company is going to continue building west. This time they go to Redstone Creek, which is about, oh, excuse me, I have a typo there, um, 37 miles from Pittsburgh to the south. And that is actually right near where the Ohio Company's initial settlement is going to take place, called Gist's Plantation. And this is where um, Christopher Gist is going to be residing for about two years before they say to him, go find some um, foreign Protestants. They're very specific. Find some foreign Protestants in Philadelphia who want to come live here. And he goes and um, brings them initially around 11 families. Now initially in their proposals they were talking about you know, several hundred families. 11 is not very many. But things are starting to heat up in the Ohio Valley and most people are saying, yeah, but maybe this isn't the best place to move right now. Um, but it's about 10 miles from Redstone Creek and it's between the Monongahela and Yakagani Rivers. But all of this um, that's been going on has not been not unnoticed by the French. They know what's happening. And on Gist's second expedition into the Ohio Valley, he also is issuing an ex, uh, invitations to this council at Logstown, where the Ohio Company is hoping to gain permission from the locals to build a settlement there. And they are um, going to be successful because of the gentleman I named before, the half king, Tenet Harrison. Tenet Harrison is trying to find a way to hold on to power. And at first, he's like, yeah, we don't really want a settlement here. The fort sounds great. We'd love more access to powder and lead, to weapons. We, you know, we like the cheap trade goods, keep them coming, but we don't know if we need settlers. And Gist is like, yeah, we need settlers to, to take care of the fort. And he says, nah, we'll make sure that they don't need anything. 
they'll be fine, we'll supply them. Uh, but eventually, he is going to, between Christopher Gist, who is going to act as one of the agents for the Colony of Virginia at this Logstown conference, along with some other members of the Ohio Company, um, he is going to negotiate so everybody can be happy. They give Tenek Harrison 2,000 pounds in goods that he can then distribute as gifts and then maintain his power. And they are also going to say, yeah, we will exclusively talk to you guys. We will deal with you directly. Beyond, we don't need to talk to the Iroquois. We can talk to you. That's a really big deal. That offers them sovereignty. That gives them more autonomy. And so the Ohio Company is offering them this, and they, in exchange, said, uh, bring on the settlers. We can take it. Now, just a few days after the Logstown Conference, the French are going to attack that Miami town of Piccolini, which is listed here as the peak town uh, on this map, which is showing where Gist went. And they are being punished for this British inclination. In fact, they are so predisposed to the British that their leader is called Old Britain. And they are going to decimate the village, kill Old Britain, and then they are going to continue their militarization by building forts, first at Presque Isle, Fort Leboeuf, and at Venango. And I should have said that the, um, the Logstown Conference is going to take place at Logstown, which I have pointed out on both of these maps. Um, and Tenek Harrison goes to the French and he protests and says like, yeah, you can't have these, uh, you can't have these forts here, oh, excuse me, went too far, um, but he's unable to stop them from building their forts. And it turns out neither could the British in 1753. Dinwiddie gets word that the French are building these forts and he is going to promptly advocate for the, for the Virginians to do something. The problem is the Virginia Assembly doesn't agree. They are not invested in the Ohio Company. They don't, they're like, no, we're not going to front the bill for us to go and militarize and defend your settlements. Um, so Dinwiddie is then going to write to the Board of Trade, and the Board of Trade is going to get these letters and say, you know, go and verify these claims. Figure out if it's true, and then if it is true, tell the French to get out. That sounds a little bit familiar, right? Because that's where Washington's going to get his instructions from. So Dinwiddie says to the, to the Board of Trade that this quote which you see here, I hope you think it's necessary to do something about this. And at the same time that the Board of Trade is reading Dinwiddie's governor, William Trent, that Ohio Company agent, writes to Dinwiddie and says, hey, I've seen it for myself. The French are militarizing the Ohio Valley. They've already built a fork on Lake Erie. They've got cannon. They've got armaments and garrisons there. Um, we need to take action right now or all is going to be lost. And he actually gives this very prophetic statement and says, the Indians are fixed upon you. You now have it in your power with small expense to save the whole country for his majesty. But if the opportunity is missed, it will never be in the power of the British to, I'm sorry, of the English to recover it, but by great expense and the united force of all of the colonies. And that's exactly what happens. <laughs> he is exactly right. Um, Trent is asking Dinwiddie to do something. Dinwiddie is asking the assembly to do something. And the Board of Trade is saying, OK, let's do something, but we've got to verify this first. And so Dinwiddie turns to the Virginia Council. Now, the assembly is who controls the purse, spring, purse strings. They're the lower chamber of the Virginia government. The Virginia Council is the upper chamber. and they already want to do something because they are very invested in the Ohio Valley, whether it's in the Ohio Company or whether it's with another land speculation company or that they have individual grants um, or they have family connections to the Ohio Company. So they are going to take action and they essentially produce a commission, a passport, and a letter to the French commandant of the Ohio Valley for their chosen emissary to deliver. And their chosen emissary is the young George Washington. Were you starting to think I was never going to get to him? I promise he's coming up. Um, now Washington is obviously related to Ohio Company members. Lawrence Washington, the founding member, is his brother. And so he comes with these Ohio Company connections. And um, Washington is the second son of a Virginia planter. He's not going to inherit a whole lot. So he's looking to climb the socioeconomic ladder of Virginia. And he figures he's going to do this from governmental and military work. And he does a pretty good job, because we've all heard of him today, right? He makes a name for himself. Um, but 
he uh, is instructed by Dinwiddie to go to Logstown, find the half king, get him to help you, give him, get him to give you some warriors, um, travel up to the French forts, deliver my letter, demand a response, and while you're doing all of this, I need you to take notes on what's going on up there. So we're ready, right? This is a military spy mission. At the same time, it is a diplomatic one. And he also writes, this is one of my favorite things, you are to learn what gave occasion to this expedition of the French. So he's basically saying, what, what makes the French think they have the right to do this? Because he is very much of the mindset. This is a British, Virginia territory. Now, a lot of people say Washington is, is chosen to be this emissary because he's familiar with the West. Well, the West that he's familiar with is the Blue Ridge Mountains. He has never been in the Ohio Valley. And the reason that Dinwiddie can choose him is because he's sending Christopher Gist with him. Now, this is what the people envisioned Gist like in the, in the 50s. This is what he looks like today. He has been resurrected as a modern day character in the video game Assassin's Creed taking part in the revolution, which is very strange because he doesn't live to see the revolution. So, but I don't design video games. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I should. But that's how they envision him. And I have been, when I found this just a few years ago, I have been researching Christopher Gist for 15 years. And all of a sudden, this is what's coming up. And I was like, what is this happening? So it was very surprising to me. Shocked me to my core. I feel like I never will be over it. <laughs> but because Gist, is this heavy hitting Ohio Valley diplomat. He knows the backcountry, he knows the Ohio Valley, he's got personal relationships, he's even been adopted by one of the bands that's living near the forks of the Ohio. He's, he, he is the heavy hitter and so they can afford to send a member of the Virginia Gentry because they're sending Gist with him. Um, and so, and Washington needs Gist skills. Washington knows it. Gist knows it, Gist knows that Washington knows all the rest. And um, one of the reasons why we know this is because right off the bat, Gist decides that he might like to not go. He gets word that his son is sick at Conica Jig. Now that's in uh, around modern day Hagerstown. Um, but he notes, as I found myself entered on public business and the major and all of the company were unwilling that I should return, I wrote and sent medicines. So. Washington knows he needs Gist here. And I don't say any of this to kind of talk down on Washington, but you know, he is 21 years old, he's young, and this expedition is part of what turns him into the man, the myth, and the legends that we all talk about today. And, but I wanna highlight Christopher Gist and his role because it allows us to see it's not just some government emissary that is able to go out here, they need the Ohio Company. And the first thing they have to do is go to get the Half King. And they actually go to Logstown, and this is depicted in this beautiful painting, Storm Clouds Gathering. And um, they are going to meet with him and they say, like, oh, we would like to get you to give us some warriors that can come with us to talk to the French. And he's like, yeah, I've been there. I've tried. They didn't listen to me. And he's very irritated. So he's anxious to do something. So he is not only going to send warriors, but he is going to go himself because he has an ax to grind with the French. And he has now thoroughly tied himself to the British interests. And the Ohio Company here is where I think we can see that Cressip and Gist and their traders have been out here building the infrastructure, mapping the land. Make, like, they've made friends with Tannock Harrison, who is like the main man controlling the forks of the Ohio River. And so any friends and any information that the Virginians have, that Washington has, is coming from the Ohio Company. But Tenek Harrison is, is, is saying like, yes, I wanna go, I wanna tell the French to get out, they're treading on my territory, this is no good for me. Um, and they're supposed to kind of go directly to Fort LeBeouf, but they end up, due to the extreme cold that can happen in the Allegheny Mountains, and it comes often unexpectedly, as we all learned last week, um, but they had to detour to Venango. And this was under the command of, it's kind of one of the French fortifications, um, a fortified home under the control of a French interpreter and go-between, um, John Kerr. And he is going to do all he can to sway Tenna Harrison and his warriors, his allies, to stay with him and not to go with Washington. Um, and kind of paints Washington's errand as this wild goose chase. 
Um, and they're going to ply him with gifts and with rum that are going to make it seem like he should stay. And they end up staying for a day. Um, but the next day, a sober Tenek Harrison um, is going to go to Washington and say, okay, I'm ready to go with you, but first I have some personal business I need to take care of. And Washington is like annoyed by this because he doesn't quite understand what the personal business is. And he refuses to go with him. But Christopher Gist does go. And it's actually the half king is going into Venango because it's a council fire. And that is what the Iroquois call areas that have been approved for official business to take place. Like you can do business here. And so he goes into this meeting and he renounces the French to the French and he attempts to return the wampum belts that the French had given the Mingo, the Shawnee, and the Delaware, all of these little brothers, as they are called, to the Iroquois, and basically saying, yeah, they're not, they're not your allies anymore. He's breaking off diplomatic relations. But the French are unwilling to accept the wampum belts, which is a huge slap in the face. So now Tenek Harrison is like even more mad. Um, and he still has this you know, business to take care of at Venango, another bit of Native American politics. And Washington does mention that Tenek Harrison has some business with a Delaware. And the real reason he had to do this business is that this Delaware man, Cuscaloga, um, is unwilling to give up his belt, his wampum belt. He won't give it to Tenek Harrison. This is showing us that the, and in, in Cuscaloga is this Delaware, it's showing us that the Delaware tribe is splitting along British and French lines. It's a major, it's a, it's a civil war amongst themselves. And the, the Tenek Harrison, again, is losing some power here. And Gist, who does understand Native American politics, is going to take extensive notes on this and detailed notes and basically sending them back to, uh, to Dinwiddie and saying, like, man, the Delaware are on the verge. This is this is really important that this is happening because they're some of our allies. And Gist is going to, you know, pass this on, and he really understands the long game that's being played for the, uh, for the Ohio Valley. Um, so they are going to uh, continue um, to, to try to keep the party united. Um, I'm sorry, and I, this is the a, a, a Half King and Christopher Gist at uh, the French Creek, which is near Venango, and I'm sorry, I forgot, I missed a slide there. But after, even after Gis finishes this business, he is saying, okay, um, we need Tenek Harrison to stay. The French are saying, like, stay here. Even though we don't want to treat with you, we don't want to do business with you, you need to stay here. And Washington writes that he's obliged to send Gist to get them. And Gist notes in his kind of dry way that he writes in his journals, John Kerr did everything he could to prevail upon our Indians to stay behind us, and I took all care to have them with us. So Gist is going to kind of forcibly bring them along, do everything he can to keep them with him. And he peels the Native Americans away, and they make their way finally to Fort LeBeouf. Now when they finally arrive, Washington's going to deliver Dinwiddie's letter, make notes on what's going on there. Um, Dinwiddie has asked the French to remove themselves. The French say no, and the commandant says, I am here by virtue of my orders of my general. I have a firm resolution to follow my orders. And to the accusation that the French had invaded Virginia and the British Empire, he says, you know, we're acting within our rights and our land claims. He's very polite to Washington, but he's still not willing to listen to him and not willing to engage in diplomacy with the half king again. And this is going to further cause the half king to become you know, invested in this British company. Um, not, not monetarily invested, but he now is personally tied to their success because they are his allies. Now, um, they are going to, after they've delivered their letter, they're going to begin their return trip, which is oftentimes where Gist's knowledge and skills are going to become even more crucial. They travel back to Venango, but on the way home, they cannot get Tenek Harrison to go with them. He stays where it's warm. He stays where there's drinks and gifts, and he's happy to stay there. And Gist and Washington and their party are going to continue to travel back alone. And Washington is really unaccustomed to these very harsh conditions, and he's going to get pretty fatigued. It's very, very cold. The Allegheny River, the Monongahela River are starting to freeze over. It's very chilly. 
and uh, Gist is trying to tell Washington, like, you know, maybe we should make camp here or you stay behind. So he's not really able to convince him. Um, Washington is traveling with him. Um, but it wasn't just the elements that they were battling. Um, they were battling some unfriendly Native Americans. On the way home, a Native American from Venango joined them and said, like, hey, I've got a, a camp nearby. You can stay here. And Gist is immediately wary, and he writes that he didn't trust this guy. He tries to hide it from Washington because Washington is just so dog tired at this point in time. He's not used to traveling in these conditions. But Washington catches on pretty soon whenever this man, who is unnamed in the, in the sources, tries to wrestle his gun from him and then takes shots at them. He pretty much guesses this guy is not their friend. <laughs> he's a, he's a, I mean, that's he's a pretty smart guy. Um, and Gists, in his kind of frontier forged practicality, is like, let's kill him. Like, he's trying to kill us. Like, this is not great. Um, but Washington did not want to go down that path. And Gist says, as you will not have him killed, we must get him away, and then we must travel all night. So poor Washington has to walk through the night in, in the very high snow and the very freezing temperatures. And Washington has to go on because Gist says that he has to. And now it's the event. This is oftentimes the painting that you see portraying the expedition to Fort LaBeouf. But it's also, you know, where Gist is really, um, you know, it's one of those moments in history. Um, Gist notes, we set out early, got to the Allegheny River, and with much, made a raft, and with much difficulty got over to an island. If you've seen the islands in the Allegheny River, they're not very big, and I can't imagine they were very warm or dry in the middle of this icy storm. And they write that the major, we had to stay on this island, the major having fallen in off the raft and my fingers frostbitten, we, the sun was down, and we contented ourselves to encamp upon that island. So building rafts, making these campsites, hauling Washington out of the freezing river, keeping him alive. Gist is really, you know, proving his mettle here and showing that, you know, they really needed these Ohio Company agents, these men with these connections and these skills to make this work. But the next, they make it through the night, and the ever-optimistic Gist comments, the cold did us some service, for in the morning it was frozen hard enough for us to pass over on the ice. So despite the extreme cold, the trip is going to kind of continue uneventfully from here on out. And the last pages of Gist's journal are detailing, you know, that Washington is going to almost collapse, but they eventually make it to the Ohio Company headquarters at Wills Creek, where Washington is going to be able to rest, kind of restore himself. He works on his journals. He writes more of the intelligence down. He kind of takes a little time and stays there. And before he goes back to Williamsburg to kind of give his reports. And again, we're seeing that, that kind of use of uh, um, the Ohio Company's you know, not only their men and their knowledge, but even their infrastructure to make this happen. Now, Washington is going to have a pretty favorable impression of Gist after this, and I think that you all can probably understand why. He saved his life a couple of times, you know, kept him alive. Um, and later on, Washington is going to make him a scouting captain in the Virginia militia. And we're going to hear a lot about him in the records of the soldiers and the records of the officers whenever Braddock is going to start his trip westward, following the Ohio Company's path, following uh, the, the path that Washington had done during this excursion in 1753. And later on, Gist will be, um, Washington will recommend Gist to become the assistant Indian superintendent, which is a pretty high up position. Um, and he notes that he has extensive dealings with the Indians and it is great esteem among them, well acquainted with their manners and their customs. And he, he I mean, he's got nothing but positive things to say about him, including the fact that he's very honest. Um, so when we get to this point, it is definitely company, colony, and crown, because that is you know, the title of my dissertation. So I'm telling you parts of what I have found. But one of the things that I have thought about since then, what could you add to the story? Or what would you like to bring out more? And one of the things I think of adding is, can I add in, should it be commoners, company, colony, and crown? Because it's really these on the ground workers who are building the empire. And then I'm thinking, well, if it wasn't for their Native American allies, they wouldn't get any further. So I'm going to have to drop my alliteration, which I do dearly love. But I'm going to have to probably, to make this 
telling the full story that it is maybe I was better off with my master's thesis all the way back in the beginning imperial intentions and independent interests because it truly is I'll go all the way back to the beginning a British American and Native American enterprise that's going to not only be the origins and the influences on Washington's trail, but on the entire French and Indian War and the entire empire building process. So even after Washington's trip, it's gonna become necessary to militarize and fight for the Ohio Valley. And we still see, even as that you know, stage of empire building that happens with those circumstances, it still remains a British American and Native American enterprise. So I would love to hear any questions that you guys have um, comments. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wander. I know I told you I was hold still, but I think now I'm gonna I'm gonna move about a bit. Does anyone have any? Oh, okay, right here first. Gist is there some of the time. He's a scout, so sometimes he's there and sometimes he is not. Um, Gist is not there then. He's with Tenek Harrison. It's kind of, as, as I'm, if I'm remembering that correctly, <laughs> trying to put it, but he's, he is scouting on the, on these trips. But I, I would have to, I'll have to double check on that. He's pretty prominent in, yeah, that's the, one of his promised most infamous moment where he is going to, you know, behead and Jumonville, the French guy who's at round that, that the British are going to ambush, uh, and then he either eats his brains or washes his hands in them, depending on which account you're going for. It's pretty memorable. Most people do remember that. So that's where most of the time we hear about Tenet Harrison. But he's got a long backstory to why he does that. You can see why he's mad. And not to explain away the violence of the situation, right? Because all of these people have are doing questionable things that we morally wouldn't want to do. But as historian, I feel like you, know, you want to understand the, what was their motivation? Why did they do it? And those were the hand over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of the, the main thing. That, that's the quick version. And then I was like unpacking it for the rest of my hour. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am in the process of my book proposal. Um, you can find the entirety of my dissertation online if you type in Emily Hager Casey Camp, Kent State. This should come up right away. Um, and you can find it and look at it. Um, I am in the hopes of, um, I'm in the middle of this book proposal, um, but I'm not quite sure if I'm going to go forward in time because for me, one of the things that happens is that um, after, the, after the French and Indian War, the British crown kind of goes back and says, yeah, we told you you could do all of this and settle the Ohio Valley, but now we don't like that idea anymore, so you can't. That's the proclamation line of 1763. And to me, that's a huge reason why the revolution comes about. It's because like, the, they're no longer partners in empire, they're adversaries saying no more empire out there for you all. So do I want to go forward and tell that story of the Ohio Company, or do I want to go back and dig into this one that I already have a little bit more? Tease out those details. Um, this is always, this is always happens. Um, I have two children and I'm having a third in case anyone didn't guess that already. Um, people always say, oh, we're Cressip and Gist on your name list because they know what I do. And I say, no, because, you know, they have some questionable moral morals. They have, you know, their, their backstory. And we don't always know what's going to be the next thing that I reveal about them. Maybe it's going to be something terrible. You know, you just don't know. Um, and so, like I said, I try not to pass any judgment on them, but rather understand them and why they do the things they do.
try to incorporate in the oral tradition that some of what you talked about. And I think that you can do that. I think you can bring that in. And I think that a lot of different organizations, um, I went to um, a conference last year that had a lot of Native American speakers, and they have these very rich histories, these very rich um, you know, uh, oral histories that have come down, which are very difficult to decipher, because just like those stories that we talked about in the beginning of class, that I heard it from my aunt who remembers it from, you know, there, there, there's a little bit of you have to engage in um, almost what is memory studies, and there's a whole host of historians who focus on oral history and memory studies. Um, I am a public historian and a colonial Americanist, and I did a little bit of study in that, but if that's a direction I'm going to go in, which is a fascinating line of research, it's going to require a lot more uh, work on my part, which is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, work is, you get good rewards, but it's just something that I am not fully trained in at this moment to pursue. But I think that um, the Park Service and different institutions are doing a really great job of bringing those stories to the forefront. And I think that's very important as well. And there are pieces um, in my work, my dissertation, there's not a whole lot, I wanna back up here so people can hear me, um, there's not a whole lot that talks about Nemecolon's involvement in the trail. There's scattered mentionings, and I do a little bit of a, uh, we won't call it a tangent, we'll call it an aside, um, talking about, well, why would we claim that he was involved if he wasn't? Why would this last through? Um, why would this tale, this, this legend continue to be told? Um, and I've been able to find back it up with some sources. But again, that's one of those things where when you bring that element of history into it, I think it's important that you know you cite it the same way you cite these other sources. Because just as you know, memory studies and oral histories can be flawed, you know, so can journals, you know? So Mm -hmm. And if I understood it correctly, it was almost a, a, a genocidal uh, uh, conquering of the, of the hunting grounds that they wanted. So some people do use those words to describe describe the beaver wars. Do you, do you get, uh, when, you, when you dig into that portion of our North American history, do you get pushback from academia? Um, I think mm, most of the time, when we see the Iroquois Confederacy, it's kind of like you have to take the good with the bad, um, and people are, are acknowledging this, but one of the things that kind of keeps it under the radar, so to speak, is the fact we don't have numbers. We don't have handwritten accounts telling us who died, when they died, you know, what happened. Um, we kind of have, again, like hazy history. We know that it happened, but so when you're getting this kind of pushback, it's a, it, it always ends up kind of going back to those sources. So that's kind of the why we don't see more of a, I think, an, 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 you know, uh, uncivil discourse on the topic, if that makes sense. Okay. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Try it, it, no, it, well, I, 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 I'm curious. I have, I have a certain impression about Native American struggle o over the land. Mm -hmm. Well, because you have to understand the Iroquois control in order to understand Tenek Harrison, right? Like, he goes together. Uh, they go together with, you know, you have to understand his position within the Iroquois Confederacy, and that, that takes you back. Now, the Beaver Wars are going to happen way before my area of research, way before my expertise comes in. Um, so it's not, it's not my main area of focus. So um, it'd be something that I would, I would love to get more um, knowledge on. I see a hand back here.
Yeah, and that is, that, is, that is very true. They are definitely being pulled by the markets and by the politics that are coming in from the Europeans. But one of the things that I always think, especially when we're talking about Native Americans, is that um, you almost get this like uh, Pocahontas paint with all the colors of the wind impression. And I think that really just takes away from their humanity. Like that's not, you know, they're not that stereotype. They are individuals with interests, like Tana Harrison and Emma Colon were, and that, you know, they are, we find, and as you can attest, a violence in Hmong Native American communities. You know, it, so it's just, it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's there, just not always brought to the light. Um, so it's uh, a group of about 10, uh, d and depending on where and when they are, because they have to separate multiple times due to the weather. Um, and that's oftentimes hard to nail down, because they say, our party. Like, okay, who was there? Um, and so we know there's a couple of other traders and trappers that are with them, and then they leave for a while with the pack horses, and then they come back, and, and then it's just Gist in Washington for a while, um, and that's just a... Yeah, it's not a big group. Now, whenever they get joined by Tenek Harrison and his warriors, the, the size grows. But even then, um, unfortunately, I can't use, I wish I could use telepathy. Like, please write down who's with you. Put that in the journal this time. Like, I would love that. <laughs> but, they, you know, that's not, that's not worked for me. My, you know, my attempts at, at ESPA have not worked. I'm sorry? Yes, they are going to follow a very, uh, very close um, I went to a conference once that was talking about the roots of Route 40, and I was talking about this, and there was a lady there who was doing her own research, and her research is obviously um, d very uh, crucial as well, but she was like, you're not in the right spot, that's a couple blocks away. And so now I'm hesitant to say exactly, yes, they follow their <laughs> path to the letter. You know, they're following the same, I always try to say, they're following the same path through the mountains, not necessarily, you know, the, the exact footsteps of of the, where, the, where they were. But in the back? So when you were talking about the attack on the Mexican Indian Union, that impacted the Mexican Indian Union, you had those two attacks, so it kind of was part of the And it's hard, it's hard to say, because we have two accounts of this, of this expedition. We're very lucky to have Gist and Washington's journals. And frustratingly, that's my thing, I get really frustrated with the people in the past for not keeping better records. Um, you know, they don't say who else was with them, but from my interpretation at that point in time, they have sent the people with the pack horses kind of on advance, and that's just the two of them. But again, I'm limited by the sources. Well, and we have all these lovely paintings. And they're a product of their own time. They're a primary resource for these times. And, and that's like, and that's the beauty of them. Whenever I get to see the 1950s interpretation of Christopher Gist, what does it say? You know, what does that tell us about what they thought about him and their impression of him? And so they become really great visual aids for me, but not really great sources to investigate the 1700s. So they go to Old Town. They go to Gist, or they go to Cressets at Old Town, and so they're not quite, they haven't made that jump into the Ohio Valley yet. That's kind of the furthest point they get to as far as going west. So Jim Washington and the two women ambassadors surveyed the Indian Trail Park? Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. And that survey, that's where Washington talks in his journals about um, seeing his first scalp, his, his uh, war dance, as he puts it, of the Native Americans who were visiting Old Town is during that trip. And so they get to Old Town, um, but that's not, we haven't quite made the cross into the Eastern Continental Divide yet at that point in time. And that's a good question. And that was part of, I, I have this huge binder full of notes uh, to talk about, things to talk about, but unfortunately, you know, they only wanted to give me an hour. I mean, I think <laughs> you got to have me back, right? Let me tell the rest of the story. Uh, so. I have one more question uh, for Evan, and we'll stay afterwards. But can you all just give her a round of applause? And can you give a round of applause to these folks? They have put in a lot of work into making a lot of events.